from Clement Blaine, software engineer at Papa Novel. And it's going to be on augmenting a legacy REST API with GraphQL. So this is definitely in the vein of digital transformation. How do you take what you've got and wrap it around the actual uh, the benefits of, of uh, GraphQL? So Clement, nice Hello. to see you. Since we're running a little late, I'm going to just hand it straight over and let you do your thing. OK, thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Clément Villain. I'm a software engineer at faber -Novel. And in this talk, I will tell you how we added GraphQL to a legacy REST API. So if you are a GraphQL expert, you can use this story to bring more developers in the GraphQL world. And uh, if you are not a GraphQL expert, then uh, you'll be happy to know that you will understand everything in this talk. So the product that is uh, interesting us is uh, called uh, BI. BI is a co-working space in Germany where you can do self-checking. So if you are looking for a co-working space in uh, Germany, please uh, take a look at them. They have uh, very nice offices. So this project started in uh, 2015. We did the backend with uh, Ruby on Rails. So uh, the code I will show you is in uh, Ruby, but uh, everything I say can be applied to another language or another framework. We also developed uh, two mobile apps and uh, one website. So we have uh, three clients that are consuming our API. We have a good test coverage, but uh, not perfect. Some features of our API are not covered. We also have uh, some functional documentation for critical features like payment, but again, uh, we lack some uh, documentation for some feature. We did a small evolution and uh, dependency upgrade uh, during the years, so our API is not outdated. And by the end of uh, 2019, we got a new big feature called BI for Business, where we want to extend the BI service for uh, enterprise. So why did we add uh, GraphQL to this project? Well, first, let's take a step back and talk about our development life cycle. So our first step is designing the, the API, designing the specification, where we design what are the endpoints, what are the resources, what are the fields available. Then we ask the front-end developer if they are OK with this specification. specification. They all, always say yes. So the development phase begins. We write the code. We send the code to review. And when the review is done, we deploy the code in the development environment, and the front end can start uh, using it. And then uh, something happens. Well, the front end needs a new field or needs an update on the API. For example, we send them an ID, but they also want a name. So we need to update that. Or uh, they have a field in the detailed representation, but they also want it in the collection. So we need to update our API. So there is a new phase. We start uh, writing code again. We send this code to review. And uh, the, when the review is done, we deploy it again in the development environment. So the, these three steps take, can take uh, from two hours to one week. So it can be very frustrating for developers and front end, for back end developers and front end developers. For backend developers, we could have done it in the first step. And for front-end developers, they are now stuck in the middle of something. They either have to do something else or use the steps. We also have other problems because we cannot add every field everywhere because of performance. Since our API is consumed by mobile application, we cannot send the data that are not required because uh, in the mobile world, the network is not very reliable. And uh, the user is uh, paying for the data they are downloading. So if they don't need the data, we should not send them. And we can have a problem with performance. Let's say we have a field that is doing a network call. 
then when this is uh, expensive, this is, is delaying the response time of our API, so we cannot add this field everywhere. So to solve our problem, we create uh, endpoints and uh, re different representat representations of the uh, same uh, resource. For example, this is a, a real life uh, project where we did seven endpoints and uh, five different representations for one project. So we got uh, something like a brief project, a core project, a regular project, a finance project. And uh, this adds a lot of complexity because we don't want to maintain uh, that kind of API. So uh, how can we solve our problem? Well, maybe GraphQL can help us. So we Googled GraphQL key features and we found that uh, GraphQL can help uh, us having better performance. Well, this is not uh, very interesting for us because um, our API response time is below one second and uh, we are happy with it. Our users are happy with it. So we are not interested in that. GraphQL can uh, provide better documentation. And again, we are happy with our current system of documentation. We use a lot and more, we use a lot of uh, automated tests uh, and the JSON schema downloaded from our documentation to make sure our documentation is correct and stays up to date. So this feature is not a game breaker. But we got another feature uh, about uh, data fetching where the front-end developers can choose uh, which fields they want. And this feature is exactly what we want. This will help us, help us, us solve our problem. Unfortunately, GraphQL comes with some drawbacks. So the learning curve is a bit high. Uh, the ecosystem is very big and it can be frightening. We have no GraphQL expert, expert inside our team. So we have no one to guide us. We need to read the documentation online. And GraphQL can be a big investment. Uh, we don't want to start from scratch. Uh, we want to release uh, some part of our code and we cannot throw away what we did during the last five years. So we finally decided that uh, GraphQL was uh, worth the shot and I will explain how we did that. So the first step was to ask the front-end developers if they wanted to use GraphQL API, otherwise uh, it would have been pointless. Then we started with uh, one feature of GraphQL, which are the queries. And we think the added value of GraphQL is here and we can do the mutation later. Uh, we, the feature we definitely want is be able to fetch uh, the front-end bay, front-end developer must be able to fetch the fields they want. So we did that. Well, the, the step, the first step was to write the test if they were missing because we will be performing a refactoring uh, later. So we don't want to break anything. We want our REST API to keep uh, working and we want the behavior to stay the same. So the only way to do that is to by writing tests. Then we refactor our business logic uh, from uh, our controller into uh, an interactor, which is a, a service object. For example, uh, when we are fetching uh, the offers, we took all the business logic, which is uh, taking available offers, the offers that are not hidden or not related to meeting room, we also uh, filter the offers that the users can see. So this is our business logic and we move all that stuff in our interactor. So in our controller, there is only things related to HTTP request or HTTP response. And for example, this controller is rendering the response and is doing nothing else. Then finally, we can write some uh, GraphQL code. So we first uh, write the query, which is the entry point. This is where the front-end developer can uh, start uh, asking for some fields. So let's say we want to expose our offer. So we just say it's a field offers. The type is a, a list of offer. And then we have to tell GraphQL how we fetch our offers. And that's where we will uh, reuse the interactor you just saw. 
And now GraphQL know how to fetch the offers and the business logic is shared between GraphQL and REST. Then we have to define to GraphQL what our, uh, an offer is. So it just like for REST serializer, we define what the fields are, what the name of the fields are, what are their types. And if some fields are not implemented by the under uh, the model under, uh, we just can add a new method to provide GraphQL the implementation for this field. So we are nearly done. We wrote some tests. Our REST API is still working. We move our business logic in, in one interactor. And so the, the code we already wrote is shared between REST and GraphQL. We have our query, our types. The front-end developers can now ask for the fields they want. And so the last step is to adapt our existing tools. So for example, we use a Chrome extension called Altair that allows us to perform the query in a very simple way. We also, also updated our documentation because um, the, uh, the documentation was providing us a REST model in uh, Ruby. And uh, we updated so that the documentation can now generate the code for the types, so we don't have to write them by n. So are we done? Well, no, we got a problem. We got uh, things called n plus one queries. So a quick reminder of uh, what are n plus one queries. n plus one queries happen when you are fetching a collection of items, and each item is in this collection is also fetching something else. Uh, let's say you are fetching uh, enterprises. So when you are fetching enterprises, you are performing one SQL query. This is a plus one, plus one query. And for each enterprise, you are also fetching the re related offers. So you are performing one query for each enterprise. So this, you are doing n queries. And uh, doing n plus one queries result in bad performance. We do not want to have a bad, bad performance in our API. So in the US world, West world, we used to solve this by adding a preload field, by adding a preload code. So we load the offers and the enterprises at the same time. So we are only performing two queries. Unfortunately, we cannot do this with GraphQL because we don't know if the offers will be loaded, will be requested by the front-end developers. So we cannot add the preload code. But we are lucky, we have a, a way to solve our problem. It's called, it's called a batch loading or data loading. Batch loading is a generic lazy batching mechanism. Um, I don't have time to explain how it works, but I gave you the links for the implementation. So in Ruby, it is called a batch loader, and in JavaScript, it is called a data loader. And the idea is that we delay the evaluation until we know which item we should load. And when we know all the items that are required to be loaded, we load them in one query. So we end up by adding a lot of code uh, to our type in order to solve our problem. But if you take a closer look, you can see that this code is uh, very generic and can be refactored. So we wrote a custom helper called the preload field. And now, when uh, in the REST world, we will add preload offers. Uh, we In GraphQL, we just use our helper preload field, and we're telling that we need to load the associations called offers. And as you can see, we don't know that behind this helper, there is a batch loading mechanism. So you don't have to know how this works. You just need to know that this field is uh, triggering an n plus one query. And then you need to use the preload field helper. So now we are really done with uh, queries. Let's talk about the front-end point of view. So from the mobile apps, the feedback was quite natural. Uh, they were not very uh, unhappy with GraphQL, but they were not very excited about it. And from the web de developer, uh, the feedback was uh, that GraphQL is awesome. And the main reason for that is that the GraphQL has a lot of tools and uh, the, it provides uh, 
features out of the box, like uh, having a loading state when they are performing the query, they got uh, pagination, they got the cache, uh, they can do a uh, optimistic uh, UI. Uh, their IDE can also generate codes from the introspection of the GraphQL endpoint. So yeah, they are very happy with it. In fact, they also wanted us to, to create the mutations endpoint. So we did that because uh, they wanted mutation because uh, of the cache uh, mechanism in uh, GraphQL, and it was easier for them to use this feature with the mutations. So the steps are very similar to what we did for the queries. We write the missing test. We extract all our business logic in one interactor, and then we add the mutation code. So for the imitation, we describe what the arguments are. We use, we describe what is the return type. For our mutation, we can either have a success or a failure. So we use the nice feature of GraphQL of a union type. And then we use the refactor interactor to perform the actual business logic of this uh, mutation. So again, for mutation, the code uh, between our REST API and GraphQL is shared. So what's next for us? Well, we need to find a way to handle file upload uh, because currently we are not only dealing with uh, JSON. We need to fix our monitoring system because everything is under GraphQL, so we don't know which queries or which mutation is performing badly. We need to demystify GraphQL for the rest of the team so they are not afraid of GraphQL. And uh, since I saw the last talk, maybe we need to review our security. So what did we learn by adding GraphQL to this project is that the learning curve is not, not that high. Uh, you can start using uh, GraphQL right away. An incremental approach is possible. You can uh, start by writing one query. Uh, and then you can add more query if you want. You can add the mutation later. And the important thing is that you can both use a GraphQL API and REST API. So if you have a project with REST, you are not stuck with REST, you can add a GraphQL. And if you are starting a new project and if you don't know if uh, REST or GraphQL is the better, which one is the better choice? Well, you can pick one and you can always switch later if you think you did a mistake. Thank you for your attention. All right. So that's always great to see an actual GraphQL in production talk <laughs> where our team really took it in and embraced it. And, and how has the experience been for the, for the developers maintaining it since then? Has it been going, going forward? Yeah. Well, we don't have many feedbacks because uh, our project is related to co-working space. And since uh, coronavirus, so the co-working space uh, shut down. So we don't have many feedbacks, but uh, we are the development phase were uh, very present, and uh, we are very happy to have switched to GraphQL over REST. That's great. We have a couple of quick questions here in the chat. I'll just touch on briefly. So one from Quentin, who is saying, "What about using the includes method on the query?" Uh, the include method. Uh, if I understood the question. Directive, right. I think, yeah. Yeah, the include query versus include query is uh, pretty much the same, and uh, you can use the include uh, if you want. As just a way to sort of pare down the actual uh, uh, response, I imagine. So it's being for yes. the, the include query can uh, trigger a live join, and you are only doing uh, one query, and with the period, you are doing uh, two queries. Yeah. Uh, Michael asks, did you consider a migration of your backend to something more natively integrated with GraphQL, like MongoDB GraphQL API? Uh, no, we did not consider it because uh, we lack uh, time. And uh, also, since we have uh, mobile apps, uh, we they are 
consuming our REST API and uh, we need to maintain that uh, REST API so we cannot throw it away. And if we switch uh, our database uh, from PostgreSQL to MongoDB, it will be a lot of work uh, maintaining this REST API and switching the database. Yeah, I think it's a fair trade-off between the technical debt required of swapping out the entire backend expertise and knowledge and where GraphQL really works well as being then this abstraction layer that sits on top of a lot of different kinds of underlying technologies. Um, Quentin had a follow-up question. He said, do you use GraphQL subscriptions at all? Or do you have any thoughts on, on that? Uh, we did not. Uh, what I learned from uh, what I know about subscription is uh, they are kind of like uh, a web socket. So we need, when you need to push uh, content to the user and uh, we don't need this feature in our project, so we did not use it. No need to add it in if you're not going to use it. <laughs> uh, and so Ben Gamble has a question and that will be, maybe I have time for one more after that. Um, to follow up on from Quentin, uh, second question, do you use anything to push the subscription data? To, oh, so there is no subscriptions, okay. Um, but to answer Ben's question, mostly I would say web sockets are kind of the primary um, standardized approach to, to pushing subscriptions these days with GraphQL. Um, that's, it's still not a concrete part of the spec, uh, it's still something that's being left up to the implementation providers. Um, push generally on the web is something that is still tricky <laughs> uh, with Chrome actually killing off the push subscriptions just this last week. Um, so, yeah. Uh, any last minute questions here before we switch to the next speaker? Just uh, probably time for one last question from the audience here. And um, if not, we will move on to the next talk. So it looks like that's probably it for now. Again, thanks for the talk. It's, uh, it's too bad the project actually <laughs> didn't get to uh, see its, its uh, fair time. <laughs> But um, like the, it's, it is always great to see where does the GraphQL promise meet the actual realities of a project in production? How does it need to be used? Uh, the different stakeholders involved. Um, that, that schema and that spec approach of actually kind of coming to the devs and saying, hey, here's how we propose to phase it out uh, or roll it out is a really thoughtful and, and good approach to really make sure everybody's on board. Uh, so. Looks like somebody's getting nostalgic about Ruby code also. Um, so <laughs> very nice. All right. Uh, thanks again. And, uh, and we'll see you around the conference.